Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, and welcome to Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can call us at 559 656 0317. You can also send any questions you have to questions at insurancehour.com. If you need help right away, you can also dial pound 250 on your cell phone. Use the keyword insurance and you will be routed to, hopefully, an agent right away that can help you. Today, I am thrilled to have a, uh, a, a guest with us that is going to provide us with more information than you can possibly imagine and uh, hopefully dispel an awful lot of rumors. I have with us Benjamin McKay. He is the CEO and Executive Director of the Surplus Lines Association of California. He has a career in both public and private sectors, expertise in insurance, regulatory affairs, legislative affairs. He has been instrumental in shaping the surplus lines market in California, being sure that the needs of consumers and businesses are handled. Uh, I, I don't want to tell, I, I mean, I can sing your praises uh, indefinitely, but I don't. want to first just welcome you so much for being here with us Thank today. Thank you, Carl. Pleasure to be here. We have an, an unbelievable change and shift in the insurance industry in California, as you are, you and I certainly know. Yeah. And if people are, are, are tuned in, they're probably aware of it as well. So before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of it, in, in your own words, can you describe briefly what does surplus lines insurance mean and how does it differ from, I suppose, standard insurance, if you want to call it that? Yeah, I, standard's a good, a good term, in fact. Uh, for what, what is also known as admitted insurance. Um, I, I usually look at the insurance world and I divide it into three parts. You have life insurance, you have health insurance, and you have P&C, property casualty insurance. So that's all your stuff, your house, your building. That's what we are. We're, we're the property and casualty insurance. It's also liability, someone falls down at your business and gets hurt, that sort of thing. But I think life and health are pretty self-explanatory. People understand those. It's this P and C part that's a little tricky. And then P and C can be further divided into standard or admitted and non-admitted and government programs like, for instance, the FAIR plan or the California Earthquake Authority. And so if you put those three together, that's the whole property and casualty pie, standard, surplus lines, government. That's the, and you know there's other kind of really weird ones if we want to get crazy like self insurance and captives <laughs> sure. and things like that but we'll, we'll avoid those because they're a very specialized small part what what the big parts the parts that matter I'm sure to your listeners are admitted also called standard surplus lines and government and 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 I should okay. warn before we get too far along I'm gonna re say words a lot because the language of insurance is so utterly confusing. We use the same word to mean three different things and three words to mean the same thing. Uh, so I, I, I've created this habit of saying, when I mean agent, I mean retail agent. When I say broker, I mean surplus, you know. Absolutely. You know what? <clears throat> the more of that, the better, because I want everyone to have a chance to try and understand it. And context clues don't always work for this. Right, stuff. right. Exactly. So, um, when we're talking about surplus lines, yes. that means, is that equivalent to a non-admitted carrier? Are those fairly synonymous terms to use? They are. They're, they're synonymous. Um, the, the only reason we use not, non-admitted, we don't like that term because it sounds like, oh, you're not licensed. <laughs> you know, there's admitted and then you're not admitted. It means you're, you're some fly-by-night. So, we like to use surplus lines. The problem, of course, is the statute used as non-admitted. So if somebody were to, to pull up the statute book and they won't find surplus lines in there, they'll find the surplus lines association in there, but they won't find surplus lines, they'll find non-admitted. And so you have to use both terms, particularly if you're testifying in front of the legislature or you're writing a white paper. Um, but surplus lines, I think, is, is a more accurate uh, description. Here's why. Um, surplus lines carriers are admitted somewhere. So they're just not admitted in California, but they have a license to write insurance in Delaware, in Nevada, somewhere else. So they are admitted somewhere. They're just not 
they're just not licensed in California. So in California, they're, they're considered a surplus lines carrier. So that's, that's and, really the, the main distinction. Um, there, we can get into a lot of the particulars, but essentially, yes, yeah, surplus lines, it simply means they're not licensed here. If you're licensed here, then you're subject to the full regulatory gamut of California. If you're licensed in Delaware, but ensuring California risks, you're, you're subject to the full gamut of Delaware. What, what are some reasons that a carrier would, and I guess this is loading the question, I'm assuming that they're, they're choosing to not uh, become admitted in California. What are some reasons that a carrier would make that choice to, be, to not obtain a license specifically in California? Yeah, well, um, so the main reason right now is, is trying to get rate and form freedom. And you know, you're seeing that because of this Prop 103 intervener process, you could, you know, if, for instance, I was just watching all these fast food restaurants because the minimum wage went up and they all increased their prices by 13%, 20% to cover that cost. Well, in insurance, you can't do that. You have to go to the Department of Insurance and say, hey, I can prove that I should charge more because now the wood I have to buy to replace your house and the nails and everything else has gone up and the workers are now making 13% more. I need to charge 13% more. And the department says, well, we're going to, we have to have a hearing. There's an intervener process and the interveners will come in and will, t- and it'll t- be a year before you get that rate increase. So maybe, maybe, yeah, it could be three years. It's taken as long right. as three years. So, so if, if you really, you know, if you're charging the right amount, which the department makes sure you're charging the lowest possible amount is what it seems to, you know, is typically what it is. Um, you're not, you're not going to be profitable. And then if too many of your houses burn, you know, it's like right now there's several wildfires. They're pretty small, but you know, in the last 20, in the two thousands, we've had nine of the worst natural catastrophes in recorded history. So in the last 24 years, nine of the 10 and the 10th one was hurricane Andrew in 96. So, you know, there, there's clearly more risk. There's clearly more, more stuff blowing down and burning and so forth. Uh, and the costs are going up. You know, the inflation is a real thing, as we've all felt it, um, you know, especially these last few years. And it affects the insurance industry. And so if you want to charge the right rate, you you have to go surplus lines because you can't get the rate typically on an admitted basis, even though the department is trying really hard to give those rate increases. This Prop 103 intervener process just drags it out. By the time you get, you know, 10 percent, it's two years later and you need another 10 percent. <laughs> Right. Interesting. I want to talk more about this. We have to take a quick break, but I, I want to touch on something you also said about rate and policy form, because there's some jargon I think might be helpful for some people. Absolutely. We'll talk about that in just two seconds. Okay. Let's talk about earthquakes for a minute. Look, we know we live in earthquake country here in California. Powerful, devastating earthquakes have happened here before, and science says that they will happen again. They can't tell us exactly when, they can just tell us that it is going to happen. Count on it. Prepare for it. Did you know that earthquakes are not covered by your homeowner's insurance policy? You need a separate policy to give you the peace of mind that you will be able to recover without getting financially wiped out the next time we get hit with a big one. There is a great company here in California that will provide you with earthquake coverage you need at a price you can afford. That company is GeoVera. I have a policy through GeoVera. I really like how easy it is to choose from all of their great coverage options, backed by the financial strength that lets me know that they will be here for me when I need them the most. Go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour to learn more. That's getquake.com slash insurance hour. Make sure you're ready for the day when the ground shakes again. Hello, hello, and welcome back. Carl Sussman with Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here. Again, if you have any questions, you can reach us at 559-656-0317. If you miss any part of this show, you can always check it out on a podcast, check it out on iHeartMedia, check it out on Amazon Alexa, TuneIn, uh, uh, YouTube, you name it, we're pretty much everywhere. Today, we are very fortunate to have Benjamin McCabe here, who is talking with us about surplus lines. Uh, Again, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Right before the break, we were talking uh, about why an insurance carrier would elect to be not admitted in a state. And you mentioned something about 
not being able to get adequate rates and also about the ability or not to have certain policy forms. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean when you say policy forms? Absolutely. And, and, and boy, I, I warned myself not to use jargon and I, and I did it right away in segment one. It's part of our industry. <laughs> it is. Form is, is just the, the, the product, the policy. The, it's, it's a contract between you and your insurer that they will, if some event happens, they will pay to make you whole, you know, based on the, the terms, meaning the words that are in that, that policy. So when we say form, we just mean your insurance policy, the, the piece of paper that you get that promises that you'll be paid if some bad, unfortunate event happens. And so in, in surplus lines, most of the policies we call, there's another big word, bespoke, which means unique, right? It's, it's each policy tends, you know, in the admitted side, you'll have an HO3 policy and everybody's homeowner's policy is pretty much the same. And the boiler, I, boilerplate is what, yeah. is what most people look at it. Their policies are on a, a basic chassis and then carriers will tweak them a little bit. That's right. Exactly. And, and there's this organization that's made up of insurance commissioners that, uh, looks at these policies and talks about the language and tries to make model laws. And, and then there's this group called ISO that creates ISO forms so that they're all standardized. But in, in surplus lines, we, we understand that some of these risks are unique. Not everybody has an antique car. Not everybody's building a building. Not, and so the, and, and not every building is on a fault line. Some, right? Some buildings are, are in a floodplain. And so the policies address those unique characteristics of the risk you know oh you're you're you have fireproof tiles or you have wood tiles or you have you know for for a roof and you know the policy will reflect will reflect those differences you know in a homeowner's policy a distinction might be you have a fire hydrant run right in front of your house or you don't have a fire hydrant within 10 blocks of your house you know that those, those sorts of things, you know, matter, and that insurance carriers will will take that into account. And in surplus lines, it's very, you know, we're, we're more specific about what the words say in in the contract. So, is it is it fair to say that with with the surplus policy or with an insur- with a surplus line insurer, they're able to be much more granular on what they underwrite for? For example, if somebody has a dog that's on the quote unquote bad list, right? And the primary market says, we don't want to insure your home because of the liability because of that dog. The sur- a surplus carrier could come in and say, we are going to do everything. We're just not going to cover if this particular dog bites someone. They can get down to that level of granularity. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and I, I think you know, the bad list is trampolines, pools, and dogs, right? And uh, that, those tend to be... Uh, they, they won't, we won't insure you list. Um, and, and the dogs change, you know, it used to be back when I, I was younger, it was, it was Doberman pincers, right? And now it's pit bulls. And so, so which dog it is that does change, but that's right. We, the surplus science policies can get more granular. Uh, it takes more work to get more granular. They'd rather, you know, have a, a more standard policy, uh, if they could, because it's, it's quicker, it's more efficient. Um, but with unique risks, risks in the, in the wooey, there's another term, the wildlife urban interface zone, that, that woodsy area kind of near urban areas, uh, you know, those policies require, uh, you know, some very specific, you know, examination we call underwriting, but you, you really want to look at the, what, you know, how much defensible space is there, you know, what is the chance that, that a fire is going to, going to burn this house? Um, you know, when you do the math and it, you know, you figure the average insurance policy in California is about four thousand dollars, and the average house is about five hundred thousand dollars, which means you know you you have to pay on that policy for sixty years before you've paid for the cost of that house. And so, if you're an insurer, you can't have too many of those houses burned down, or you're gonna you're gonna go out of business pretty quick. Right, and that's just the fire portion. We're not talking about a liability loss or something else that might happen and and, and cost some money. So. You know, the California marketplace, as everyone I'm sure that's paying attention realizes, is in crisis mode right now. So the surplus line carriers are really put, getting a lot of pressure put on them, both by market forces and by 
uh, ironically, consumer groups to, to step in. Uh, I say that with a smile because it's usually the consumer groups that, that like to have a jaundiced eye toward you know, the non-admitted market. And all of a sudden, they're, they've come around asking for help. So can you speak a little bit about how the surplus lines industry in general and the carriers have, have stepped up when it comes to property insurance in California since this insurance shortage has begun? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, and, the, and that really is one of the key roles of the surplus lines industry is to step in when the, the admitted standard market pulls back. So we're not allowed to write business that the admitted market is willing. We're not allowed to place business, insure houses, buildings, that the admitted market is willing to insure. Uh, we specifically have to go to the admitted market, three different carriers who write a certain type of business and ask them in writing and put it in an affidavit, a legal document that says, you know, we swear we talked to three of these insurers and they said they, they wouldn't write this exact policy. Uh, then we can write it, then we can insure it. And, and so it's, you know, it's very, very specific. The law is very specific and we're prohibited from writing it unless they don't want to. If they don't want to, we come in and we're able to insure it. Now, if we can't insure it, that's where the, the government part kicks in. But what you're seeing in the current marketplace is surplus lines is, is, is growing dramatically, you know, hundreds of percent over the last couple of years. Uh, because of that pullback, as we've all seen in the news, all of these admitted insurers either pulling out of the state completely or stopping writing new business, and surplus lines has filled filled that gap largely. Uh, now there's limits. You know, if they pull back too much. We're we're really not a huge part of the market uh, compared to the admitted market. So there there's going to be capacity issues even with lots of private equity and lots of money is flowing to insurance, but. The, the scope of the problem is so big that it, it still threatens to outstrip the capacity. Well, that's that's the thing, right, is that there's still a finite amount of, of capacity out there, regardless of if they're admitted carriers or not. You mentioned something that I want to talk about right after our break, which is what has to be done before a consumer can actually purchase a policy from you, all of these affidavits and things. Let's talk about that as soon as we come right back. Benjamin, we'll be right back. Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Greg. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the windowtothemagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello, and welcome back. I'm Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here. We are talking about surplus lines insurance with Ben McKay, and I want to just jump right back in. We have so much to cover. Right before the break, we were talking about some of the... the I guess you could call it red tape. Some of the processes that have to happen before a California consumer can actually buy from a non-admitted company. It's interesting because I always think about buying cars. I can go buy whatever car I want. There's no stoppage. There, there's no law that says you can't do this, you can't do that. There are no hoops I have to jump through. But interestingly enough, if you want to purchase insurance from a particular insurance company, there are steps you have to go through as a consumer. And as we're going to hear now, also steps that the insurer has to go through before the two of you can actually be paired together. Um, ben, you want to walk us through that process? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So if you want to, if you can't, let's use homeowners as the example. If you want to buy homeowners insurance and your agent, you, your Carl Sussman can't find an admitted carrier, say, you know, State Farm, I'll say any of these carriers that are with, are no longer writing in California. You then can go to the surplus lines market, but only after you ask 
three of those carriers, admitted carriers, who write that type of business. So you can't go to a carrier that doesn't write homeowners and say, hey, will you write this homeowner's policy? Uh, we know you only do auto, so you know, say no, and then I can go to the surplus lines marketplace. It has to be a carrier that writes that kind of insurance, that, you know, houses, you know, within the range of your house, you know, 100,000 to 500,000, whatever it is. Uh, and you have to then fill out an SL2 form, newly designed SL2 form, which is a legal affidavit. And you have to put down the name of that carrier, the phone number, who you talk to, so that it can be verified that you actually did uh, talk. To. Now, you as an individual aren't going to do this. Your agent's going to do this for you. Right. I, I was waiting for a break to be able to, to ask you the, the burning question. You're saying you have to go to three places. Yeah. Consumers don't have to call three places. Correct. If they're dealing with an independent broker, this is something that they have to do sort of on the back end. Uh, correct. Now, if you're not dealing with a broker, you would have to, you, you know, you you could do, you would have to do this yourself. Um, but you're, you're probably not doing that, I would guess. Um, you also have to file... Um, you, the, the retail agent has to um, file a D1, which is this disclosure form that essentially makes sure you know that this is a surplus lines policy, and then they have to maintain that in their records. So there's 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 some paperwork, and then you have to go find the the surplus lines carrier, and that can be challenging because they're not household names. Um, you know, people haven't heard of, of Lexington and Ironshore and, you know, these, these carriers because they're, they're really known uh, to in surplus lines brokers who, who place business with them because they're not allowed to advertise. So you're, you're not hearing about them. That, because- that's an interesting one right there. I, I want to pause you on that. So you're saying that if a carrier is not admitted to do business in California, they can't place ads on television? That's right. That's why you'll never see, you'll never see a you know a Lexington commercial in in California and and so that's that's the other reason they're a little bit tricky to find and you know why you need your you know your agent to go uh, either direct or work with a surplus lines broker to to find carriers who you know a, a exist and B will uh, ensure your particular kind of risk um, and and it it really gets complicated or funny complicated i think people turn their brains off so let me let me erase not complicated (laughs) it's um it it gets interesting because if you're an insurance carrier admitted in say nevada florida texas somewhere else you're considered a foreign insurer to a california insurance consumer so you're you're foreign even though you're still in the united states we we consider you foreign you're foreign to california if you're located outside of the United States, so you're in Japan, you're in Switzerland, then you're considered an alien. So I'm laughing because you and I know these terms, and it's funny when you say them because they see they're so poorly poorly chosen <laughs> defined, right? Yes. But yeah, they're aliens. Yeah, they're they're aliens, and and of course, you know, in the modern political context, it's, it's even worse, right, to call them aliens, but. When you go to your your insured and you say, "Hey, I had to place your insurance policy with an alien," they they, they they're gonna look at you funny. <laughs> say, yeah, I don't right. I don't want my policy placed with an alien. I don't know how to get to Mars to you know collect on that policy. Um, but those are the terms that have been in play in place for years and years and decades, if not centuries. And and so that those are the terms that are used in the statute. So we use them again, just like we we have to. Make sure, even though surplus lines is better, we talk about non-admitted because it's the term of art and it's in the statute. So that would you say that it's fair to say that one of the reasons that we we don't see we're we're not recognizing some of these non-admitted carriers is specifically because of regulation that prevents them from marketing. So we simply aren't exposed to them. Is that a fair statement? I I think that's a very fair statement. Yeah. And is it true that there are some companies, non-admitted companies? that are actually owned by or are subsidiaries of admitted companies or names that we might be familiar with? It, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact... Tell us about that. Yeah. So basically, all of the carriers you know, Liberty Mutual, Travelers, Nationwide, they all have surplus lines carriers in their group. So it'll be the Nationwide group, and they'll have admitted carriers, and they'll have surplus lines carriers in that group. And in fact, if you if you you want to take a nice trip to London and you go to Lloyd's of London, they they have these 
what they call they call them boxes. They're just groups of desks where different insurance carriers, they call them syndicates there, different syndicates set up. And if you went there a hundred years ago, you might see the Ben McKay syndicate or the Carl Sussman syndicate. If you go there today, it's travelers. You see the traveler's umbrella, you, you know, you see the Liberty Mutual statue. You see, it's all the ones that you, you see that you're barraged by on TV constantly. Um, they're all the, the syndicates now. So, so yes, it's a really good point. It, it really, it ends up with a few exceptions. It ends up being all of these, you know, behemoth insurance companies, um, that in some, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, progressive set up a surplus lines insurer to insure, uh, Uber, you know, it's a very unique type of risk. You know, this transportation network company is what, what we call Uber in, in statute. It's a very unique risk. Um, because you have the app and the, you know, what, what, how much are they insured for when the app's on and then versus when someone's in the car versus when they're cruising around looking for somebody, you know, there's different insurance limits for each of those three stages. And, and, uh, so they had to set up a special purpose company to, in, to insure that risk. And it's, it's certainly been challenging. They weren't the first one to insure over, um, and, and but they it's interesting because like you said, and I want to talk about this more right after the break. These are owned by companies that we do know. Let, let's talk about it a little bit more as soon as we come right back. Ben, stand by. Got it. Do you need homeowner's insurance? Has your previous insurance company left the state, non-renewed your policy, or maybe they just raised your premium to an amount that you simply can't afford? Whatever the situation, we can help. Just dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote and we will connect you with an agent who can assist you right away. Or if you prefer, you can visit us online at insurancehour.com forward slash quotes. Whether you're looking for homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, we'll send the best options straight to you. So what are you waiting for? Simply dial pound 250 and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with a live agent to help provide competitive quotes for your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. Don't get caught unprepared. Insure what matters with an insurance company you can trust and with a premium that you can afford. Don't put off until tomorrow what you should have done yesterday. Simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote. Hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Carl Sussman and you are tuned into Insurance Hour. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, of course, anytime, 559-656-0317, or you can send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Any immediate questions or concerns, you can dial pound 250 from any mobile phone, use the keyword insurance and get connected to an agent that can help you right away. Today we have our special guest, Ben McKay, and he is helping us understand the surplus slash non-admitted insurance <laughs> marketplace. I have to get the wording just right, right? Yes. And before the break, we were talking about carriers that are non-admitted actually being owned by carriers that are and that we might recognize. Ben, you wanted to explain how that works and, and how that would potentially be an area that consumers should be aware of? Yeah, so so it, it's it's really uh, corporate law. So you can you can have many legal entities under the same corporate umbrella. So if you're Liberty Mutual, it's not just one company. It's ten companies or twenty companies. If you're nationwide, the same. Um, if you're Berkshire Hathaway, you're an insurance company. You're a railroad. You're you're an investment company. You're Geico. You're you know you're you're. It doesn't even have to all be the same business. You know, it could be it could be completely diversified, uh, and that's pretty typical in in corporate America these days. And so, you you might be dealing with a surplus lines insurer, but that surplus lines insurer very well could be owned and probably is owned by an admitted carrier, uh, or more and more owned by private equity groups, which which are you know all the rage in the last you know decade or so buying buying all kinds of, of businesses and, and recently getting into the insurance space. Let's let's talk a little bit about how we can subdivide certain carriers that are not admitted in California with the with the Leslie list. I, I get a lot of questions from people that say, do I know if this is a good company? Do they have enough money? Has anybody checked them out if they're not admitted in California? Can you explain 
the Leslie List, how it works, what type of background checking, if, if you're comfortable staying, that the Department of Insurance does, and, yep. and what an, a general consumer should be able to take away from that. Absolutely, absolutely. So the Leslie List is the list of approved surplus lines insurers. So here we go mixing terms again, surplus lines, not non-admitted. But so the list of approved surplus lines insurers is a list that is owned by the department, but most of the research is done by us at the Surplus Lines Association. And carriers who want to be on the list, it's a voluntary list, they have to submit to us uh, proof of financial stability, proof of seasoning that their management team has been in the insurance business for for a uh, sufficient amount of time, usually at least three years, that they, they've done this kind of business that they're looking to write, whether it's homeowners or construction or or whatever uh, it is, that, that they have expertise in that. And they submit all of this documentation to, to us. We review it, and we have a whole team of financial analysts that will look at uh, – not only the management, but how their capital is kept. Is their capital, you know, so for instance, in California, you have to have $45 million in capital in surplus or the equivalent. And there's buckets. So 20 million has to be very, very safe. You know, in other words, like treasuries, you know, they, it has to be, you can't lose that money. And then the next 20 can be a little bit um, more, you, you know, a little bit less solid. It can be, for instance, like securities, but it has to be AAA rated, you know, versus, you know, uh, credit default swaps. Or and just to reiterate, you're talking about how an insurance carrier is maintaining their reserves, the money they keep on hand. Correct. The money they have on hand. Now, and, and, and to compare that to an admitted carrier or a licensed carrier, they need about $1 million in paid in capital and about $2.6 million in surplus. And that's that's about it. Um, and Why the discrepancy? Uh, because the department, the belief is, or the, the public policy is that they're, they're more heavily uh, scrutinized by the department. So, and that, that number goes up, by the way, as they write policies, that amount that they have to keep in reserve increases. So that what I'm talking about is just the sort of table stakes, just to hang a shingle and say, you know, we're Ben McKay Insurance Company. Uh, license in California, um, the numbers are, are much less. The, 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 so the public policy is they're more heavily scrutinized, so they don't need as much money because they're watched constantly. There's market conduct examinations, etc. cetera. Um, in reality, um, there was this crisis a few years ago and, and uh, this housing crisis, and they, there was legislation that came out of it called the Dodd-Frank Act in 2015. And in that legislation, there was a section that uh, addressed surplus lines insurance and essentially said that there's a minimum uh, surplus lines insurers can, can write in any state where they meet certain minimum requirements, which essentially are they're admitted somewhere. So they're licensed in another jurisdiction and they have 15 million in capital or surplus, but it also permitted, so this is a federal law, it permitted states to increase that minimum. And California chose to increase it from 15 to 45. So, I'm, I'm shocked <laughs> at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's really why it, it, was, it was really just, it came out in the legal wranglings, what feels right at the time in 2015, what number, and then 2016 in California. What amount feels safe for consumers, and that's that's the number we landed on. Um, you know, they call it you know law and sausages the the two things you don't want to see made because it's just so so nauseating. Uh, you know, this is an example. It's just that sometimes there's not a ton of rhyme or reason. It's just kind of your best, you know, the the policymaker's best best effort. So it, it, it's fair to, for someone to say that if they're going to purchase insurance from a non admitted company that it's a reasonable ask to ask your broker if they're on the Leslie list, or is that a list that they can just go and look up themselves online and, and check themselves? They, they can absolutely check it online. It's a, it's on the uh, surplus lines, SLACAL.com. It's on our website, just type L-A-S-L-I and uh, Leslie list, and it'll come up. It's also on the Department of Insurance, uh, the CDI.gov website, and you can see it there. 
highly recommended. You don't have to be on the Lasley list to ensure risks in, in California, but if you're not on the Lasley list, there's no, there's no telling uh, what your actual financial situation is. Uh, it could be fine. Uh, it, it, it could not be fine. Uh, you know, an example that a regulator told me one time was a, there was a company that claimed uh, to have $15 million worth of olive oil. And that was one of their assets. And they had a, they had one of those giant containers you see on the side oh, of the wow. road that you think are filled with gas. And, and an inspector actually went up and climbed up the stairs all the way around and opened the big hatch, you know, the ch -ch -ch, open hatch and stuck a stick in and the stick went down about it's six sick. inches. And hold, hold that thought. We got to talk more about <laughs> olive oil. We got to take a quick break. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Greg. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the windowtothemagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello, this is Carl Sussman, and you are tuned into Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We are learning all about non-admitted insurance companies, a.k.a. surplus lines, insurance carriers, a.k.a. Olive oil. Olive oil. I think that's going to be a new one. <laughs> ben Decay is our special guest. We Before the break, we were talking. And again, if you've missed any of this, be sure to go back online and find us. Just search for Insurance Hour. You'll find it as a podcast. You'll find it on YouTube. You'll find it everywhere. Ben was explaining how um, different insurance carriers maintain their their uh, their money, basically, their their funds. And he was talking about a very interesting one. Ben, tell, start that one over again. I want to hear it again. Well, so assets are assets, and they could be anything, gold bars or, in one case, olive oil. And, and this company claimed to have $15 million worth of olive oil in this giant tank. And an inspector went out and climbed up the giant tank and opened the hatch and stuck a stick down, and the stick went six inches down. So, you know, they had, a, you know, a, a, a few thousand dollars worth of olive oil today. I don't know. Maybe it would be a million dollars worth of olive oil. But it certainly wasn't $15 million that they had claimed. And, and so companies that aren't reviewed, that aren't on the Lasley list, aren't reviewed by us, reviewed by the Department of Insurance, you, you never really know. And, and, you know, when something bad happens, like a giant wildfire that wipes, you know, the one in paradise, for instance, that horrific event, an insurance carrier just folded immediately. As soon as that fire, you know, probably before the fire was even put out, they went out of business. They handed the keys to the building, to the department. So you want to make sure that, you know, not only do you have insurance, but you have insurance with a carrier that's going to be able to pay that claim, right? Because that's ultimately what we're selling. We're selling a promise. And that promise is that we'll be able to pay that claim when the when the bad event happens so that you'll be made whole. And, and and so if you, you, you go with an insurance carrier that's not financially secure, that promise may be broken. And you and so you're saying that this this list is something they de people should definitely check out. And they sh and relatively speaking, that is a level of of oversight yeah. that's being done that might not be necessarily by the Department of Insurance or it includes is. them or or how, what's their involvement in that? Yeah, it's their list. They say yeah. they have final say on what what carriers go on that list. Um, so we review them, they review them. Uh, so it is absolutely a level of oversight. Um, the list of approved surplus lines insurers, uh, carriers want to be on it because it's the good, it's essentially the good housekeeping seal of approval. It says that they've, they've uh, gone through the scrutiny, they've gone through the, the financial review crucible and they came out uh, the other side uh, successful. And they have the money they say they have they're being watched. It's not just a one-time deal. We, we review them on an ongoing basis. 
so it, it's certainly a level of certainty that that uh, an insurer an insured can have that their promise is going to be the promise is going to be kept. Do you have to date us by using saying good housekeeping? Did I? Anyone that's going to get that <laughs> reference, like you and I, all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, my sciatica. Oh, something that, <laughs> I don't, good yeah. housekeeping, seal of approval. But I, maybe we'll call it the Better Business Bureau. Better, that, better. That's a little more, that, that feels a little more maybe current, right? Go back and edit that out. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll try and we'll just pretend we didn't hear that. So, it, so if now that we've covered the general idea that a non-admitted carrier, surplus lines carrier, number one, might be a carrier that you know of, you know, in in a different in a by by a different name. Number two, there is a way that you can even check on these carriers by the California Department of Insurance and others to be sure that they have the financial wherewithal to be taking on the risks that they do. So. We understand that. Now, talk, talk to us about the process, how it differs for a consumer. If a consumer is going to a broker and they're purchasing a policy, how does it differ from if they were to go to a broker and purchase a policy that went with, let's say, Mercury? Instead, they go to a broker and they're purchasing a policy that's going to be going through any number of surplus line companies. How is that going to differ? I know we touched on it with regard to the forms that have to be signed. Talk to us about the money and, the, and how payments are made and things of that nature. Yep. So ideally, for the consumer, it would feel the same, um, but that's ideally. You would go to your, your retail agent, your retail agent would go to a surplus lines broker typically, but they could go straight to the carrier. Um, you know, There are certainly retail brokers that have surplus lines licenses uh, who can go directly to a surplus lines carrier. But in order to access a surplus lines carrier, you have to have a surplus lines license or you have to be an individual constituent, uh, which never happens, but effectively I could go to London and buy a surplus lines policy from a London syndicate, but that you know is, doesn't typically happen. What happens is I go to my retail agent, my retail agent goes to a surplus lines broker or is a surplus lines broker, and they go to a surplus lines carrier. That's called, another term, exporting the policy you're exporting it out of California to a surplus lines carrier. That exporting process has to be done by a surplus lines carrier, well, a surplus lines broker. And, and so that's that surplus. And why? Because that surplus lines broker is the person who is responsible for the transaction. And by responsible, I mean legally responsible for the transaction. They're the, they're the person whose license is going to get revoked. They're the person who's going to get fined. If if the transaction goes bad. So if they place the, the policy with a company that's not uh, financially stable, if they place the wrong coverage, if they fail to place coverage after taking your money and promising to place coverage, they're, they're the person who, who's, we, it's called a broker responsibility state and the broker is responsible. So that person has to be licensed and they're licensed by the state of California. So while the carrier is licensed by some other state or some other country, the broker is licensed here in California, and that gives California jurisdiction over that person. So they can haul and are you board. referring to the retail broker or the surplus lines broker sure. or both? You, well, both, yeah, but I was, I was referring to the surplus lines broker specifically, but yes, both are licensed here in, in California. Um, and, and so the state has control, jurisdiction over both of them because you're within the borders of the state. So they they can get you. And so and the that, relationship that your broker has with their surplus broker, in essence, is significant. So that's something that maybe consumers would like to know as well when they're talking to their broker and they're getting a proposal yeah. is to maybe ask them. I, you know, I see this as a surplus policy. This is a non-admitted carrier. Have you been working with the brokerage that you're obtaining this from for a long time? What's your relationship like? Have you had uh, positive experiences? Claims are different. Payments are different. And I want to talk about how they differ from an admitted market policy. And I know, like you said, ideally it would be transparent to the client. But when we come back from the break, I want to go over briefly how it works with a non-admitted carrier, how who pays who. And at the end of the day, if there's a claim, who are you going to contact and who would you expect to have come out and handle those claims since if they're not domiciled, they're not licensed in California, is there some difference in how claims might be handled? So a little bit of preview of what we're going to talk about 
in our final segment coming up. Ben McKay with us today, and we'll be back with you in just a moment. Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration, and we're here to change your experience. Where others see obstacles, we see opportunities. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we're prepared to leap. Looking under every rock, exploring every avenue, that's not just what we do, it's who we are. Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. We don't just meet expectations, we surpass them. If you're tired of hearing no or it's not possible, it's time to turn to a team that believes in yes and let's make it happen. Don't settle for less. Reach out to Sussman Insurance Agency at 877-411-5200. Visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com or email sales at sussmaninsurance.com. Let's uncover the insurance solutions you deserve. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman, and you are tuned into Insurance Hour. If you missed any part of this show, there's a ton of important information here. Make sure you go online, search for Insurance Hour, grab it as a podcast, grab it on YouTube, find it somewhere because there is information here that you definitely want to have. Ben, in our final segment, I want to make sure that we hit on everything, and it's hard to combine so much information in such a short time. I appreciate you trying. One of the things that we do get asked with some frequency is when you go to your broker and you ask, and they're, you're looking to get an insurance policy, and they go to, say, a surplus lines broker, what does that surplus line broker do? Do they just immediately go to one insurance company for a quote, or do they check with multiple carriers, or what's the general process? Yeah, they are... They are required to go to multiple markets because you know they want to get you the best coverage for the best price and so they you should ask them or your agent should ask them what markets did you go to you know what what did the market say um you know obviously that doesn't always happen but you know it's certainly within your your right you're also going to want to know uh besides just the relationship what what's in that relationship how much is uh, you know, how much is the surplus lines uh, broker getting paid? How much is the is the retail agent getting paid? Is it a percent? Are there fees? Uh, all of those, particularly on a personal lines policy, they need to be disclosed. And and the rules are a little bit different for commercial lines because they assume you have lawyers and risk managers and people like that who are going to scrutinize. But for individuals, um, you know, you do have to have some agency of your, your own agency and, and ask these questions yourself totally appropriate. Your agent will, you know, if you have a good agent, which you probably do, you're, they're going to show you anyway, but it's, but it's appropriate to ask and it's appropriate to know what is the financial relationship between the retail agent and the, the surplus lines broker. Okay. Two, two other quick points. I want to be sure we get in. Typically, if you buy a policy from an, from an admitted carrier, maybe even a direct to consumer carrier, you're going to pay your premium to the insurance company. If there's a claim, the insurance company is going to send out one of their employees to deal with the claim. How would that differ potentially if you're purchasing a policy from your broker with a non-admitted carrier? Yeah, so it, it, and that's something that varies. Uh, some surplus lines brokers do claims, uh, meaning that they'll come out and adjust the claim. Uh, some don't. Some carriers will allow it. Some carriers will not allow it. Uh, typically, you're going to get an independent claims adjuster at that point who's, who's going to come out and do an assessment of, of the damage. Uh, if they work for the carrier, they may not even be licensed in the state. Uh, if they're an independent uh, claims adjuster, they will be. Uh, uh, so that's, <clears throat> that's really the distinction. You're going to want to know the difference. You're going to want to ask them. Uh, what what their status is with the state, uh, it it doesn't necessarily mean one's bad, but you you certainly want to know what your recourse is. If somebody's licensed with the state, you can go after their license. If they're not licensed with the state, you can't go after the license. Now you got to go to court and you know sue them and that sort of thing. And then if they don't live in the state, you have to try and sue them in another state, which gets tricky as well. Uh, so just as a legal matter. Uh, you, you, you want to make sure you understand that. And that's part of that relationship you want to understand between your retail agent and your surplus science broker. Does that broker handle claims? Right. That, that's something you're, you're, you're going to want to know. A, that's, a big, it's, that's a big one. Yep. And what about premium payments? Where does the consumer pay the premium that's going to be going at some point reaching the surplus lines carrier? 
Yeah. So, so there is, there, there's a big debate over whether carriers can direct bill and, or whether it has to go through the retail agent. And, and, and the issue is this, once the retail agent receives payment from this, from the insured, that policy is deemed to be placed. So even if the retail agent doesn't ever give them the, the carrier, the money, the carrier still has to pay the claim. Wow. So, so they, that's what, so carriers are really anxious about not getting paid directly. So they want to get, they typically, they would prefer to get paid directly. So they know they have the premium because they're on the claim as soon as the, the retail agent gets, gets paid. So, uh, from a consumer standpoint, the good news is once you pay, uh, the agent or the carrier, you're covered. So you're, you're going to get, you're going to get your claim paid. Um, but, but it, it can vary between those two. But typically it goes to the retail agent, retail agent to the surplus lines or to the carrier, carrier then rebate, well, not rebate, but then gives the percentage to the surplus lines broker that they're owed. And those numbers vary significantly. And, and that's, you know, and that can affect your price as well. You know, surplus lines, where the more people you put into this. Everybody pipeline, wants to make a buck. Everybody wants to make a buck. <laughs> yep. I gotcha. Well, you know, in the last couple of minutes, what I want to talk a little bit about is you know, obviously with the crisis in California and unfolding all over the country, frankly, there's been a, an increase in business that's going to the excess surplus line, not admitted. Throw in your new version of it, uh, olive oil. That's going to be my new one, carrier. And what do you see happening as California starts to update their regulations and potentially some of the more the, the more admit I call them the name brand uh, carriers the carriers that are admitted yeah. in California start to start uh, begin writing business again. How do you see the the long term impact of that uh, when that starts to occur? Yeah, so I mean, as as prices go up, more people will get come back and more name brands will come back into the market uh, as they as they you know the the governor just came out last week and said for every um, dollar that insurance carriers, admitted carriers are receiving in premium, they're paying out a dollar 14, right? So they're, they're 14% underwater uh, and, and on every policy. And that's just not sustainable, uh, which is why they're cutting back. So I think what happens is a couple of things. Number one, California is getting serious about managing the forest. Right. That's that's really been one of the driving forces in rate increases is the fact that there's been so many losses. You know, if you have a concentration of risk, you, you have 100 houses in a 200 house community and they all burn. Right. You, you know, you're, you're in trouble as an insurer. You need one house here, one house over here, another house, you know, over in in, in New Jersey, house, because they're unlikely to be affected by the same event. But if you're very focus, you know, your concentration is great in an area that's problematic. So as we take care of the forests, which one of the one piece of evidence that we're taking care of them is we're doing controlled burns again. And and so <clears throat> many years ago, I think in the 70s, we decided we're going to let the forests take care of themselves. And that didn't work so well. And 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 skip ahead, you know, to to all the wildfires we've had in the last in the last 10 years. And finally, we said, okay, that didn't work. Now we're going to do controlled burns. I actually got a phone call from one of the environmental groups and uh, they said, Hey, we, the state decided they're going to do controlled burns again, but we, I said, great, we need it. And they said, but we have a, one problem. I said, what's that? Well, the companies that do the controlled burns can't get insurance. <sighs> Ben, I want to talk more with you about it, but we're out of time today. Will you come back and chat with us some more another time? I'd love to. Absolutely. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Everybody, Ben McKay, thank you so much for spending time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.